Hello guys, we are going to discuss the questions from neuro, orthal and squint. Hypermetropia may cause, hypermetropia may cause what? Convergent squint. So the answer is esotropia. Okay, hypermetropia causes convergent squint which is very very important. It has been an often asked question. So this is a repeat question. So you should never make a mistake in your repeat questions. Yes, so now you are so used to hearing this word PYQ. So no PYQs, you should make a mistake. Okay, so rather than saying PYQ, we'll say repeat question, then I think the seriousness increases. Which of the following has a common embryological origin with levator? palpebrae superioris. So I have taught you that the superior rectus and the LPS have a common embryological origin. All right. So this goes into the lid, upper lid, the LPS and the superior rectus gets attached to the sclera. So that is why in certain clinical conditions we have both of them involved. So the answer is superior rectus. The following is not a feature of incompetent squint. Now, what is incompetent squint? They are asking us not a feature. The amount of squint varies in the nine gazes. So, option A is the definition. So, it is true. Primary deviation is lesser than secondary deviation or in other words, so what they are trying to tell us, primary deviation is lesser than secondary deviation which implies secondary deviation is more than primary deviation which is again true. Non-committent squint or incommittent squint. Thyroid disease is a cause because thyroid disease causes restrictive squint. So restrictive and paralytic squints cause incommittent squint again true is associated with full eye movements in all gazes how can you have full eye movements in restrictive and paralytic squints no false yes so read the question carefully and get your answer while performing words four dot test the patient reports seeing an image as below okay what is the interpretation so now he is seeing five dots See, we are showing him only four dots, but this guy is seeing five dots. The moment he sees five dots, it means there is diplopia. So there is no right eye suppression and I know you might be tempted to answer B because it looks very fancy, abnormal retinal correspondence. Abnormal retinal correspondence is when a patient with squint sees four dots. That is abnormal ret retinal correspondence. But my patient is seeing five dots. So this is ruled out. Now cross diplopia or uncrossed diplopia. Now for this, it's very simple. The patient right eye, if he is wearing red and left eye, he is wearing green. Yes. Now when you look at the image that is given to you, they're saying this is what the patient sees. So the patient sees, this is his left visual field, this is his right visual field. So we are depicting the patient's vision. So go back to your visual fields, how you will represent visual fields. Okay. So this is left visual field and the uh, that is right visual field. So the patient is seeing as it is. So left side he is wearing green and right side he is wearing red. So as it is he's seeing, so this is an uncrossed diplopia. If it is a cross diplopia, it would be the other way around. Is that clear? Patient is unable to see the right halves of his visual field. They had not given this image. This is how it would be. He is not able to see the right half because I just told you this side is the left visual field. This side is the right visual field. And this is the left half of the left visual field this is the left half of the right visual field this is the right half of the left visual field this is the right half of the right visual field as you see it okay so right halves left occipital lobe 
I will have a macular sparing. Occipital lobe means I will have a macular sparing which is not mentioned. And number two, whenever I have a right visual field defect. So definitely I have a right visual field defect. I have a left sided lesion. So anything right I can rule out straight away. So option C is ruled out. Now left occipital lobe I have macular sparing which is not the case. Left optic tract I will have a typical right homonymous hemianopia like in the picture. Exactly like this. So our answer is left optic tract. Clear? So he is not able to see the right halves like in the picture. So exactly what is the visual field defect? It's a right hemianopia. But this image was not given to you. So we had to deal only with the worded options. A 35 year old female patient presented with sudden onset of visual loss in the left eye. Pain while moving her left eye on examination. No redness, normal anterior chamber, left RAPD and fundus examination showed a normal optic nerve. What is the most likely diagnosis? Optic neuritis, yes, looks like. Neuromyelitis optica, you would have presentation of optic neuritis plus transverse myelitis, which is not the case here. There is no mention of anything suggestive of transverse myelitis. Pituitary tumor, I don't have anything suggestive of pituitary tumor because pituitary tumor, I'm going to have a bilateral visual field defect. So there would be something bilateral here. It's only left. So this is ruled out. Anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, I'm going to have a pale optic disc edema or hyperemic optic disc edema. I will have a disc edema. I cannot have normal and the age is older for AIO1. This is not the age and no risk factor is present. So typically optic neuritis. So this must have been the retrobulbar neuritis. So that is why you've got pain on movements and the optic disc is normal. So our answer is optic neuritis. Clear? Yeah. A 23 year old female presented with sudden decrease in vision in the left eye. History of two similar episodes in the past. Vision in the left eye is 6 by 60. Left sided RAPD. Neurological examination reveals weakness in the left leg. Fundus examination reveals no abnormality. Which of the following investigations is least likely to be needed in this patient? So first of all, what is the diagnosis? So the diagnosis is definitely there is something like an optic neuritis, a retrobulbar neuritis plus a transverse myelitis which has resulted in the weakness of the leg. And this optic neuritis, there has been history of this repeated episodes. So all this is telling me that this is most likely to be neuromyelitis optica. Now for neuromyelitis optica, I need to do MRI of orbit plus brain definitely I need to run that of the spine MRI spine and the CSF analysis looking for aquaporin 4 antibody yes because this is diagnostic of NMO this is pathognomonic of NMO now for the first episode, we will not do because any first episode, we will always think of if it's a first episode of optic neuritis. Think of multiple sclerosis. 
so i would probably just do mri of the orbit and brain okay so this is the other scenario but here we have repeated episodes and i'm thinking of neuromyelitis optica so i have to do these but what is my question asking my question is asking least likely needed mri spine yes i need lumbar spine puncture and csf analysis yes i need this i need esr not really least likely needed so esr in this case is that clear to everyone all of the following are causes of primary optic atrophy except see primary optic atrophy what is the definition not preceded by this edema that means there is no disc edema that has occurred in the natural history leading to optic atrophy long yes it is primary leber's hereditary optic neuropathy it's primary optic atrophy optic neuritis let's wait glaucoma yes has there been any edema no cavernous optic atrophy is a morphological description but when you're looking at the pathological description uh, i'm sorry when you're looking at the ophthalmoscopic description has there been any disc edema in glaucoma no retinitis pigmentosa as you all know it's a consecutive optic atrophy secondary to retinal diseases where you have a waxy yellow pallor of the optic disc so definitely not in retinitis pigmentosa now what about optic neuritis see in a retrobulbar neuritis there is no disc edema so primary optic atrophy whereas if you talk about the papillitis version and neuroretinitis they can result in secondary optic atrophy but what is the most common type retrobulbar neuritis so all except would be your retinitis pigmentosa where you get a consecutive optic atrophy and consecutive op optic atrophy only is that clear it's always about best options keyhole vision See keyhole vision. Everybody did it right. Keyhole vision and also a keyhole visual field defect. Either way, your answer is going to be LGB option B. Nortnagel syndrome. See Nortnagel syndrome is going to cause vesicular involvement of third nerve at the superior cerebellar. peduncle now for this i have told you very very easy way to remember superior see on the map it's always not yes not this up this is not but still you can remember the not and the not not is always superior so superior we have only superior only the cerebellar peduncles we have superior middle and inferior so superior cerebellar peduncle right ipsilateral third nerve palsy and ipsilateral ataxia okay ipsilateral third nerve palsy and ipsilateral ataxia so that is your answer because of the double decussation of the cerebellar fibers you will have ipsilateral cerebellar findings no matter how much it hurts now some day you will look back and realize your struggles changed your life for the better so as i keep telling you don't look at everyday struggles as overwhelming it might hurt for today but it's for your better tomorrow so keep working hard if you have any doubts any questions you can always reach out to me on the imentor app on the chat box of the imentor app so i will respond to you guys so all the best to all of you